That was the most important thing to me, was getting high. Most of my life, I was miserable. You know, it's like, how do you know you're in denial when you're in denial? Lost my virginity at 12. I couldn't look myself in the mirror. I don't want to be in the darkness. I never liked myself. Drug use cost me everything, 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 everything. Drugs are a plague on humanity. Every nation has been affected. Every city, every family, every home. We all bear the scars. We all know the consequences. We have all suffered loss. Drug abuse has been so deeply entrenched in our society, most people alive today can't remember life before drugs. In a culture that only focuses on bad news and gossip, it's easy to lose hope, to walk away from the battle and feel discouraged, to feel like you don't matter. Take heart. Good things are happening all around the world today. Lift your heads high. Find the strength you've been searching for. Be encouraged. You may find what you've been looking for as these people tell their stories of what it finally took to quit. Uh, my name is John Tunnell, but when I was born, my name was Sun Elk Shepherd Surefoot. I grew up on hippie communes. The first time that I took the took the joint and um, smoked and you know whatever, I was three years old. I was kind of born into drugs. That being said, when I was about five, uh, my mom decided to change her life and that this was not the place to be raising three children, but that she needed to uh, get out of that environment. And so we went to live with her mom in Florida. Shortly after that, I started going to Catholic private school, which was a completely different world. Then um, my mom brought home a guy from work that she was working for, and she said, yeah, this is Chris Tunnell. And I was like, whatever, that's nice. And she was his secretary. He had been a Marine, and then he had decided to be a Catholic priest. And so he um, was about to take his vows very shortly. Um, and then he met my mom. And so she brought him home one day and said, this is Chris Tunnell, and we're like, nice to meet you. And then almost immediately after that, she said, and by the way, we are moving to Lake Charles, Louisiana with him. Uh, I got made fun of a lot, I got bullied a lot, and you know, when Chris came around, <clears throat> He had been a Marine, and so he basically said, you know, if you're going to be the new kid, then you have to go and find the biggest guy out there, and you beat him bloody. You beat his face, and you leave marks on him, and you let him know that, um, and, and let everybody know that you're the biggest, meanest, craziest guy around, and if you do that, then nobody will mess with you anymore. And I didn't want to fight, but he assured me and my little brother and sister that if we didn't beat these people up and if he heard that somebody was picking on us and we didn't stand up for ourselves then he would beat us when we got home and uh, the thought of fighting somebody my age or the thought of fighting a big marine I chose fighting the other kids. Kristinell married my mom <clears throat> and so when he did he adopted me and my brother and my sister which was nice of him and so we all got new names and my new name was John Joseph Tunnell instead of Sun Elk Shepherd Surefoot. Chris Tunnell used to tell a lot of glory stories about when he did drugs when he was younger and how he dealt drugs and all kinds of things and he would make sure to tell us that if we ever did drugs that our life would be over, that we would never um, be able to get a job and that we would never be able to um, have a life at all because they would uh, drug test us and then they would give us lie detector tests and we could never ever have a good job after that. And I remember thinking, I don't care. This is not an issue for me because I don't want to do drugs and so it's a, not a thing for me. I, I'm not the least bit concerned about anything that you're saying, but I believed him and I, you know, as a kid I just never put it together that he did a bunch of drugs and sold drugs and he had a job. Uh, as time passed, I started listening to heavy metal, like I said, and I was, um, it grew my hair out and I was with the cool, cool kids, the freaks or whatever. And uh, time passed and I, somebody passed a joint and I was at a party and I thought, 
there's no way for me to get out of this. And I didn't want to do it, to be honest with you. I, I just didn't want people to know that I wasn't as cool as I let on. So I went ahead and I smoked weed. And in all honesty, at that point, I just thought, I guess my life is over. I'll never have a job and I'll never have anything good and I'll have to go through lie detector tests and whatever. And I just thought, well, if that's the case, then might as well throw it all away and go out in a blaze of glory. And so I did. I, I fell fast and hard and it wasn't long and I was doing every kind of drug that came along. Uh, a friend of mine that lived here in Kennedale, his dad was a meth cook and he stole $5,000 worth of pure, raw, uncut meth um, from his dad and we did it all. I mean, me and a couple friends did $5,000 worth of meth in a relatively short amount of time. Now, they didn't call it meth back then. I, they were calling it crank and I didn't know what it was. We were putting it in, we'd empty out pills and then we'd stuff it in there. And <clears throat> it was actually a pretty good sized pill. So in retrospect, I was taking a, a lot of meth and I didn't know it. I would be up for weeks at a time, um, as long as two weeks at a time without sleeping, without eating. Um, obviously you lose a lot of weight. Your eyes are all dilated and you're wanting to tweak on everything and <clears throat> clean stuff just because you got so much energy that you need nervous energy, not good energy. Um, of course, you're out of your mind anyway. Nothing really constructive ever happened. It was, you know, I had to pretend like I wasn't staying up all night. So in my room, I just sit there and chew the inside of my cheeks off and chew the inside of my lips off and try to go out. I would, I'd try to go out. Um, we had our own door. We had a garage that was converted, and so me and my brother had our own door, and we'd go out and we'd steal every night um, so that we could get enough money to get drugs, and we'd do drugs, and um, that went on for quite a while and I ran away from home I got put in rehab by that point I was selling a lot of drugs I was doing a lot of acid I was doing a lot of meth coke um, opium you name it pills whatever whatever I get my hands on at that point and my mom said if you come home high one more time I'm calling the cops on you and that was the last time that I lived with my mom as a, as a young person uh, because what she didn't realize is that even though I was lying to her, I had a pound of weed and a sheet of acid in my guitar case, and I would have probably, in my mind, done quite a bit of jail time for that. Uh, realistically, I probably would have got a slap on the wrist or something, but you know, as a 14, 15 year old kid, they probably would have been like, how'd you get this or whatever. But at the time I thought, man, I'm gonna go to jail for a long time, and I didn't wanna do that. So I snuck out my window and I never came back home. I got robbed several times. I got robbed at knife point, and I got robbed at gunpoint. Um, and I was not scared. I was upset that I had uh, lost my drugs. I was upset that I was in this situation or that I let this thing happen to me or whatever, but I was not scared like for my life. I didn't really care um, if I lived or died. And, and for whatever reason, I guess I felt invincible. I didn't feel like I was gonna die, so it just never, never bothered me and I had already been groomed to be you know just a rough mean person. I went to a concert one night it was the Headbangers Ball Tour 1989. That day I dropped um, five hits of acid and this acid that I was taking that I was selling was filled with strychnine and strychnine is rat poison and they told me when I first started they said if you take two hits or more you're probably risking death because this is filled with rat poison. And so that lasted not very long at all. In my first time I did a half a hit and then I did a hit and then almost right after that I did two and then it just escalated up and it probably within a year I did about 300 hits or something like that. They say that, um, or I've heard, I don't know if it's medically true, that acid um, does not leave your system, that it goes to your spinal cord, your nervous system and your brain and there it sits for the rest of your life and that you never actually come down off of acid that you just get used to it and you learn to live with it and you know they say that anybody who has done even one hit of acid is legally insane. I'm at this concert and I'm um, you know frying my brain out I'm laughing and my friends are there and I'm seeing a concert and I'm loving it because you know I whatever 
And all of a sudden, I, um, I fall back in my chair and I can't move at all for a while. And I'm struggling with everything within me to try to just sit up. And I can't. I can't move anything at all. And I'm thinking, this is pretty weird and pretty scary. So after what seemed like a very, very long time, I finally, I mustered all the energy I could and I pulled myself forward. And when I did, I was like, oh, finally I can move. And I turned around and I was still sitting there. I could see my body still sitting behind me. And yet I was out of my body, but still felt like I was in my body looking back at my body and I thought this is bad I've heard of this <laughs> this means I'm probably dead and I did not believe in life after death I did not believe in God I didn't know what I believed I believed in heavy metal I believed in maybe reincarnation or witchcraft the occult or something like that Satanism I did not believe in life after death though I really didn't think that that would happen to me and I thought I am too young to die I'm only 16 years old this can't be the end for me this doesn't feel right and I put my hands on my face and when I did my eye jumped out of my head and starts twitching around in my hand and I'm I'm looking at my eye and my eye is in my hand and I can see it this way and I can see it this way and I was like I am frying my brain right now. Like, this is horrible. And I, I was thinking, I can't, I, I'm gonna hurt myself. And so I shoved my eye back in my head. I was like, oh wow, that is, that's crazy. And I put my hands like this, and when I do, my ears, my ears shrivel up. They just suck inside my head. And it's like two holes, like, um, like, like buttholes in, in my, on the side of my head. And I start putting my fingers in there and I think, man, it, I, I don't know what's real and what's not real. And I'm gonna hurt myself. So I get my hands away from my head and I'm like, whoa, man. And I had long hair at the time. And I reach in the back of my skull and there's a flap, like maybe this big. And I start reaching my hand into this flap and like feeling around and feeling my brain. And I'm like, John, you were gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> you, were gonna, you were gonna kill yourself or do some serious damage. And so I pull my hand back out of my head and I'm like, okay, I, I can't touch anything. Um, I, I gotta, I gotta just ride this thing out. And then it's like I, I see um, all in a flash, all at once. It's difficult to explain, but it was like all the bad things that I'd done to people and they all I, it, it's like I saw them and then they happened back to me, like they mirrored back on me, but worse, like in an instant. And it, nobody had to explain to me what I had done. Nobody had to explain to me um, why it, or what had happened in these situations. I instantly remembered. And when it happened back to me, I realized um, I deserve this. And then it felt like, then, then all, the, all the heavy metal satanic kind of music that I was listening to, it was going through my head. And all the things that I was glorifying, all the things I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, the devil. Then it would start happening to me. And I felt like the body parts were just falling off. I felt like I was just disintegrating, it just into like, I don't know, like, like yuck, you know, like, um, like you see zombies, just body parts falling off and being all squishy and gross. It was kind of like that. And I, at this point, I turned to my friend who's next to me and he is gone. My friend is gone. And there's this demon and he's got this big, big nasty eye. Um, and he's just <laughs> coming after me. And at that point, I, I turn away from him and I look and all around me, this concert is gone. Um, 
And all I see are demons flying around, and I see just hellacious images, just images of death and destruction and hell all around me, and evil, um, you know, indescribable evil, just stuff that we know um, that I had delved deep into that was a part of me. It was really all that I knew, and it was everywhere surrounding me. And I realized at this moment, and this was probably the first time in my life that I was legitimately scared, and I realized I have died, and I'm in hell. And this is scary. And I'm just a kid. Uh, and I thought, I'm never going to smile again. I'm never going to see a friendly face again. I am never going to have peace or rest again. I will be here forever. I will be here in a hundred years, and a thousand years, and a million years, and a billion years. This is where I will be. And I was like, this cannot be. I, I cannot live here forever. And they, I know that there will be no rest, and I know that there's no finality to this. I cannot get out of this. I cannot die to escape this. This is, as many times as I die here, this will be where I spend eternity. And I deserve it. And uh, that was very scary, very, very scary for me. And I thought, there has to be a loophole. There has to be some way out of this. And I thought, well, I got to think fast because if I really am dead, then I've got seconds or, or maybe minutes to get this thing right. And if I don't, there will be some very serious eternal consequences. And so I'm scrambling, and I'm scrambling in my head, and I'm thinking, okay, what can I do? And I was thinking, you can't just take a cold shower or, or drink coffee. You can't really just go to the doctor, even if I could talk, which I couldn't. Um, who do I go to for this? Who do I ask for for help? Who do I go to for this? Who do I ask for for help? And. I could think of nothing. And I thought, you know, there's, there's a couple choices here. Either one, I'm really having a bad trip, and if so, I just took a lot of acid. And so I've got a long, hard ride. If it's just a bad trip, I've got a long, hard ride um, to, to do. And I might not survive this. I might do myself some serious harm. Number two, I could be on a permanent trip. I could just be out of my mind for the rest of my life. And it happens to a lot of people. It happens where they just never, never come down. And it doesn't matter if there's blue skies and butterflies and kids playing in the park around you because in your head, all you're seeing is just this god-awful insanity. And at that point to me, I thought I might as well be dead and in hell because I wouldn't know the difference. Or the third option is that I really am dead and I really am in hell, and if that's the case, I've got to get out of here right now. Because this is horrible. And I thought, if it takes me a thousand years to claw my way out of here, I don't care what I have to do. If I have to go through raw sewage and tight spaces and torture and fights and whatever it takes to get me out of here, and however long it takes to get me out of here, I will do it. I cannot spend forever here. And I realized the clock was ticking and I thought, what can I possibly do? What can I possibly do to get out of here? And I came up with nothing. And then I thought, unless unless there really is a God and He will have mercy on my soul. That is my only hope. Apart from that, there is nothing. And I, for the first time in my life, prayed. And I didn't know how to do it, and I'm sure it was probably riddled with cuss words and I didn't even know the difference. But to me, it was the most sincere thing I've ever done in my life. And I said, God, 
I don't know if I believe in you, and I don't deserve anything from you. I know that I'm a bad guy to the core, and I don't know what I could even offer you, but I swear to you, if you save me from this, I will do anything that you ask, anything at all. You want me to get heavy water from the bottom of the sea? I'm your guy. You want me to go and get liquid hot magma from the bottom of the volcano? I will find a way. You want me to go to the farthest reaches of space? I don't know how, but I'll do it. Anything that you ask me to do, I will do it. Please, please, please save me from this place. Save me from this hell. And I'll tell you that within probably a minute of me praying that, I either was back alive again or I was sober. And I don't care which. And I don't think that it matters. Um, I think that God came down that day and He did a miracle in my life. He heard my cry. And if He sobered me up, or if He saved me from a permanent trip, or if He took me from hell, and really from being dead, I will probably never know. But it does not matter to me because I prayed and I asked for it and He answered. And He saved me from hell. And as soon as I, as soon as reality clicked in, as soon as I could move again, I looked at my friends and I said, we gotta go. We gotta get out of here. And they're all, and they're like, okay, whatever you say, <clears throat> out of their minds. So we leave. And I told them, I said, I died tonight. Tonight, I died and I went to hell. And I am done with this life. I am done with it. And they're like, bro, you just had a bad trip. You don't know what you're talking about. You just, just had a bad trip. You just got to get back up on that horse. And I was like, nope. Nope, I think I'm going to stay off of that horse. I think that I... I'm going to stay away from this stuff. And they just kept beating me down, beating me down over time. And I finally agreed. I <clears throat> kept doing drugs. I'm ashamed to say it, but I did. I kept selling drugs. I kept doing hard drugs. I kept doing meth. I kept doing acid. I kept smoking weed. And then I had um, flashbacks and I had nightmares every day and every night. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Um, I felt like my eyes were bleeding constantly, like my eye was not in my head, and that my eyes were just, just bleeding, just constantly. I felt like um, that I was constantly fighting a, a demon, um, some kind of a battle, like a legitimate battle, like physical demons there wanting to kill me and chasing after me and trying to torture me, and they wanted my soul. And <clears throat> I spent quite a while living my life like that. And every night was just hellacious nightmares, like indescribable things. Like you take the worst horror movie that you've ever seen and you multiply that by 10 and then make it feel like you're really the one living in that. And that's what my days and nights were like for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> and after a while I decided, you know what? It gets, this gets worse when I do the drugs. And so I was like, all right, no more hard drugs. And so I was like, I'm done with acid, and I'm done with um, meth, and I'm done with, you know, all the hard stuff. I'm just smoking weed and drinking, that's it. And so that lasted for a little while. More time passed, and they were like, bro, you just gotta get back up on this horse here, drop some acid. I was like, I'm gonna take one hit, that's it, one, just to see if maybe I can jar this thing loose or whatever and get back to my normal self because I do not like what I am. I instantly realized this is a horrible mistake. And I went to my room and I was like, nobody bother me because I'm gonna hurt myself or kill myself or hurt one of you or kill one of you. And I don't wanna do any of those things. So please, no matter what happens, don't come through this door until I come out and it'll be tomorrow. And I thought, I'll just pray. That worked before and God will be there for my, for my rescue. And so I thought, that's what I'll do, I'll just pray. And I prayed sincerely, and more sincerely than the first time. And God did not answer. He was not there. He did not want to hear what I had to say. And then he came to me. And he came right up into my face, and he looked me just face to face. 
I mean, like right up in my face. And he said, and, and he was, I just want to say, I've realized that my brain was fried, but he was beautiful, just a beautiful face and long white beard and just a beautiful, beautiful creature. And he came right up into my face and he said, now I've got to teach you a lesson. And I was like, no, 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 no. And then he turned around and he flew away. And he was gone. And it was like a comet trail followed behind him. And all this stuff just had just colors and sparkles, it's hard to explain, just falling off of him like a, like a comet's tail would. And he was gone in an instant. And all this stuff was just falling down in his trail. And I thought, please, no, please. Please now. And as it fell, the beauty finally faded, and I um, looked down, and I was like waist deep in sewage, just in raw sewage. Just it was everywhere around me. And I thought, no, please, please. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I realized I had promised God that I would get the heavy water or the magma or the, go to space or whatever and and anything he asked I would do it and I had done nothing that he asked nothing at all I had just kept on in my rotten miserable lifestyle I decided I'm gonna quit doing drugs and I ended up at my friend's house uh, Jeff and Jeff passed out because he was drunk and high. And I did not pass out because I was not drunk and high and I was used to staying up all night long. And I didn't want to sit in the room where he was because that's weird. So I went to the living room and it's midnight on a Friday night and this guy, his little brother, is watching the prayer channel. And I thought, oh man, really? But it's his house. And so I was like, oh, whatever. Let's see what this is about. So I sit there and I'm watching it, kind of in front of him. He's back here on the couch and I'm kind of laying there, you know, watching it or whatever. And I'm not a TV evangelist guy, like even to this day I'm not. But this preacher on TV, and I don't know who it was, he, it was like he looked through the TV set and he goes, John Tonell, you are doing blah, 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 blah. That's what you're doing, right? I'm like, yes. And he's like, this is where it's going to lead you, and this is what's going to happen, and this is what's going on. And I just thought, yeah, sounds, sounds about right. I mean, everything you're saying is piercing me to my heart. Uh, and he's like, if anybody has anything that they want to pray about, then you pray with me. And I thought, man, I want to pray so bad. I mean, I want relief from these nightmares and from the flashbacks and from all the stuff that I've done. I just want to be done with it. But I don't deserve anything from God and I don't know how to pray. And I teared up. And my friend's little brother turns off the TV and he's like, mm -hmm, we'll go, ready to go to bed. And he looks over at me and I'm tearing up. And I think, all right, I made fun of you a lot. Let's have it. I would do it to you. And he didn't. He did not make fun of me. He didn't make me feel little or anything. He just he said, man, you go through a hard time, you want to talk? And I thought, well, I didn't expect that, but sure. So I did. And I explained to him all the hellacious things I was going through and what happened and whatnot. And he's like, man, you're, you're having a hard time. I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. And uh, then he starts explaining to me, he goes, you know, do you know what heaven's like? And I was like, man, no, I, um, maybe like real empty, like clouds and stuff, like being way up in the sky, but like boring, like there's nothing to do and you can't do anything fun and like anything that would be fun, you can't do it because if you did, then you have to go to hell and you know, like real empty, like I don't know, like maybe angels playing harps or some garbage, I don't know, no, I don't know, what, whatever, I could tell you about hell. I can tell you about the depths of hell. This is something I know a lot about. And he said, well, the Bible says, and he opens it up, he says, the Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has even entered into the mind of man 
what God has in store for those that love him. And I was like, okay. And he said, have you seen some pretty cool stuff? I was like, dude, yeah, I mean, I've been around. I, I went to 22 schools in 22 states. I've been around and I've seen some really cool stuff. I mean, I've seen some beautiful places, lots of landmarks, lots of tourist stuff, you name it. Uh, I've seen some beautiful stuff. And he's like, well, that pales in comparison to what heaven has for you. And he's like, you, have you heard some cool stuff? I'm like, bro, I listen to the best music in the world. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I've heard some cool stuff. He's like, it pales in comparison to what God has in store for you. And I thought, hmm, I think you're pushing your luck here. Well, I guess you've heard Iron Maiden. Uh, says, can you imagine some cool stuff? I'm like, you don't understand, man. My, my imagination is like off the charts. Yeah, of course I can imagine some stuff. And he goes, well, what your future is, if you choose God, is better than the stuff that you can imagine imagining, if you can imagine that. I was like, well, obviously I can't. So then he opens up uh, Revelation 21 and 22, the last two chapters in the Bible, and he says, you know, I, I want to show you what heaven's like. And, and he reads about the streets of gold that are so pure, they're like transparent glass. And he reads about the pearly gates and he reads about the foundations and the, the jewels and everything else, um, which is, it sounds beautiful. But then he said, there will be no more death and there'll be no more sorrow and there'll be no more tears and there'll be no more suffering because the old order of things has passed away. And you will see God face to face and He will be your God, and you will, they will be His people. We will be His people. And, um, and I cried. I didn't cry because I was happy. I cried because I knew I will never be in that place. I will never see that place. I don't deserve to be there. Somebody with a heart like mine, somebody with a life like mine, will never be in a place like that. And it saddened me. I'd never given heaven a second thought, but it saddened me uh, to the core because all of a sudden, what I'd never even heard of, I wanted more badly than words could explain. Uh, and he saw that I was tearing up and he said, well, what's the matter? And I was like, I'm, I'm never gonna be. Here. I'm never going to be in heaven. Um, I'm hoping for a little bit more time here and I'll try to make the best of it or whatever, but I'm probably going back to hell. I mean, let's be honest. I've been a bad guy and I've done a lot of bad things and I said, I don't, I don't know even how to be good. Um, I don't even know how to um, go about it. Like, I, I if, if you were to take all the bad things I've done and, and you were to put them on a scale and then you took all the good things I've done and you put those on a scale, um, it would not even register. I mean, it would just, it wouldn't measure up to anything. And I thought, you know, I mean, I, I don't even know what good deeds are. I guess I would help a little old lady across the street or I, I mean, maybe help a kid with his homework or something. I don't know. Feed the homeless. I don't know. But it, as much of that as I could imagine doing in a whole lifetime would not make up for what I've done. So I'm, I'm never gonna be, I'm never gonna see that place. Um, thanks for telling me about it. Now I feel miserable. <laughs> and he said, well, the truth is that none of us deserve that. And I was like, well, me more than others. I don't deserve that. Um, and he said, you know, um, the thing is that Jesus died in your place. He took the punishment for your sin so that you could go to heaven, so that you could live forever so that you would be washed clean of this, so that you wouldn't have the guilt, so that you wouldn't have these nightmares, and so that you wouldn't have hell, but that, that He loves you that much, that if you were the only guy on earth, He would have done that for you. And I remember being overwhelmed, and I thought, why would He do that for me? Like, don't you know what I am? And he asked if I wanted to pray. And once again, I was like, man, yeah. Yeah, I do, but I don't know how. And he led me through the sinner's prayer. And um, I had hope for probably the first time in my life. 
some time passed and uh, that friend of mine that said, hey, you ought to go to church. I was like, yeah, probably still not. I'm probably still not gonna do that. And he said, well, they got free barbecue and I gotta be honest with you, I was starving. And I was like, oh, man, I'd love to go to your church. It was written all over me, what I was. And we get there and he's like, so you wanna go inside now? I'm like, oh man, let's just, maybe we can just do the barbecue thing. You know, I mean, I don't really wanna kind of mess this up for myself. I'm pretty sure lightning's gonna strike me or some bad thing's gonna happen. And it's like, come on. So he keeps pushing and finally he's like, okay, I've caved into your good peer pressure. Let's go into the church. So we go in. I'm thinking, I'm gonna sneak in the back. I'll sit down real quick. Nobody's gonna notice me. Maybe sit there for 10 or 15 minutes. We're at the door, have some barbecue. I'm out of here. Incorrect. I walk in the door and there's about six pews in there. And there's no hiding me. And this pastor, who I'm thinking is probably going to take this opportunity to demonstrate what bad people are like to the rest of his congregation, he smiles real big and real genuine. And he just says, come on in. Let me tell you what we're talking about. And I was like, OK. So I come in. I sit in the front row, which is you know 12 feet or whatever. And he just rewinds the sermon and just tells me the whole thing. And once again, it's just like the same thing I heard on TV. Like, John, you're doing this and 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 this. I was like, yep. And this are, these are the things that are happening and these are the things that could happen. I was like, yep. Once again, you know, at the end of it, you know, I was pierced to the heart. I, I had never heard words like these before. Nothing had ever rung true to me before. Uh, and he said, if anybody wants to pray, you come forward, I'll pray with you. Instantly, a whole bunch of people got in the line and wanted to pray. And I thought, man, man, I want to pray. But, you know, I'm 45 minutes late. People don't know me. Iron Maiden shirt, you know, late, emaciated drug addict, every bad thing. And all these excuses came to me. And the guy next to me that brought me is like, come on, man, stand up. You know you need to pray. You're a mess. I'm like, yeah, I'm a mess, but I'm not going to get up. Come on, man, you got to get up. So finally, after all these excuses and all this mountain out of a molehill in my own mind, I stand up and I'm like, fine. And I take two steps forward and I'm in front of the pastor. And he says, what can I do for you, young man? And I said, well, I, I think I, I think I want to get baptized. And he says, well, why is that? I was like, because I'm a sinner. And I just start bawling. And um, he prays with me. And he turns me around, and I'm thinking this would be the point where you demonstrate people, this is what a bad person looks like, don't do this, otherwise you'll end up like this jerk. And instead, he turns me around and he aims me at the congregation. He says, all the angels in heaven rejoice when even one sinner comes to repentance. And I can hear them shouting for joy for this young man <laughs> right now. And I want you all to come up here and shake his hand and welcome him to welcome him into the kingdom of heaven. And then they did. Everybody in that church got up single file, one by one, and stood in a line, and to a complete stranger, who was a mess, shook my hand, hugged me like they meant it, said kind words to me, loved me, and then they fed me. And the following week, I got baptized. And when I did, uh, I went into the water and I felt um, dirty, just dirty, head to toe, in sin. I went in this little stock tank and I thought I'm gonna get bit by a snake or something. I thought, well, pff, I'd rather die doing the right thing than live the rest of my life doing the wrong thing. I'm gonna take my chances. So I, uh, I go down to the stock tank, I felt dirty, filthy, and he just said, John Tunnell, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he dunked me into the water, and I remember feeling dirty, 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 until I went into the water, and he lifted me back up, and I felt clean. For the first time in my life, I felt clean. As soon as I got home from being baptized, I got on a plane, got what little bit of stuff I had, and flew to North Carolina. And I dried out, I sobered up. I 
got rid of everything, and I went through some god-awful withdrawals, and they were miserable, and I feel for anybody going through withdrawals. They're not fun at all. But I went through them, I suffered through it, and I was like, I am not gonna do this anymore. Done, cold turkey. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs, no nothing. And I do not regret it at all. I regret doing it in the first place. If I had it to do over again, I would not. If I had it to do over again, if I had my entire life to do over again and I knew what I knew now, I would never try to touch a drug. You do whatever in the world you have to do to get off of drugs. You get off and you go cold turkey. You put that stuff down and you turn around and you walk away and you never look back. No matter how tempting it might be, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how painful it is, no matter how bad your withdrawals are, no matter what in the world happens to you, you put it down and you do not look back at all. At first, it's very, very difficult. You know, the first time I had to say no to weed, it was like unbelievable. I just thought, oh man, it's taking everything I got just to say no, but I'm gonna hold out and I'm just not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna do it. And the next time it was just slightly easier and the next time it was just slightly easier than that. Because the truth is that every time you say yes to something, it becomes easier and easier to say yes to it. And every time that you say no to something, it becomes easier and easier to say no to it. I, I genuinely hope that my story has helped you. Um, there is nothing special about me. I am not a better person or a stronger person than anybody, any of you that is watching this. I wish you all the luck in the world. God bless you.